that we're having. Uh, we're going to wait for just a couple more minutes to see if we can get that resolved and then begin. So continue to converse amongst yourselves. Talk amongst yourselves. We're all verklempt. Yes, okay. I don't know how many personalities are nervous. Oh, um, he's, he's, go ahead. I would say he's decently strong. Um, and I'm on a good mic. Yeah. Good afternoon. Today's final presentation will explore God's intentions for marriage and remarriage. Um, I've had the pleasure of watching Luke grow in this process and his understanding of God, uh, of himself in this process as well. He spent an entire year and one long Bible study project. Um, and as Mr. Hoshauer can tell you, he's, he knows every, no stone has, has been unturned in this issue. He has considered everything um, with humility and wisdom, and it's been an absolute joy to work with him. Luke, let me pray for you before you come up. Father, I thank you and praise you for Luke's humility, for his commitment to growth, uh, to his commitment to holy living. Um, I've spent hours in conversation with him about not only his topic, but but other matters in his, his life as well, and he, he, he longs to glorify you. And Father, I ask that as he comes up here to speak, that he would do that no less today than he has in the past, that he would glorify you, that we would look at his wisdom, we would look at his um, heart, the end of his hard work here, and that we would be able to, um, to praise you and thank you for a gift that Luke is to us. Lord, you are good and we love you. Amen. Covenant. 
as defined by Dr. Jim's boss and Meredith Klein. A covenant is a commitment made before God, with God as witness and judge over that commitment. Now, since it is a divinely sanctioned commitment, to break that covenant is thereby clearly sin. And it is for this reason that Jesus says, For God has joined together, let no man separate. But God designed marriage with a purpose in mind. He designed the covenant of marriage to reflect the relationship between Christ and the church. In Ephesians 5, Paul says that the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, and the wife is the body of the husband, just as the church is Christ's body. Wives should be in submission to their husbands, and husbands should love their wives, just as Christ loved the church. Sacrificially and unconditionally. So marriage is a lifelong male-female covenant relationship between one man and one woman that reflects the relationship between Christ and his church. Now the second term to define is divorce. Divorce is the ending of the marriage covenant while both parties are still living. However, there's two different kinds of divorce. There is legitimate divorce and illegitimate divorce. Legitimate divorce is when someone divorces their spouse for a reason permitted by God in his word. In this case, the marriage covenant is over, and that person is not bound to that covenant, and they are free to remarry. On the other hand, illegitimate divorce is when someone divorces their spouse for a reason that is not permitted by God in his word. In this case, although legally divorced, in the eyes of God, those people are still married and still bound to that covenant. But from the outset, I want to make it clear that divorce is never God's intention. In Malachi 2.16, God says, for I hate divorce. God never desires for anyone to get divorced. And finally, before I move to my argument, I want to make arguments. I want to make some final clarifications of some terms I will be using throughout my argument. When I make reference to one spouse is innocent and one spouse is guilty, I want to be clear that I'm not saying all the guilt of that marriage is upon one spouse, while one spouse is entirely free of all guilt. What I'm talking about there is the basis for the ending of the marriage. The guilty spouse is the spouse whose actions were the basis for the ending of the marriage, while the innocent spouse is the spouse whose actions were not the basis. And finally, I want to make the clarification that I'm making a moral biblical argument about when you can get remarried biblically, not about when you can do so legally. So now to my first argument. In every situation in which the Bible discusses remarriage, the premise for that discussion is on how the first marriage ended. J. Adams observes that remarriage after divorce is not allowed unless one has been properly released from their first spouse. So what he says is the permission to remarry is based on whether you have been released from your first spouse, whether you're free from that covenant or still bound to it. It's based on that first marriage. But is this true biblically? In order to prove that it is, I want to look at three passages briefly. And the point to be observed here is not the specifics of the passages. I will get into that here in a little bit. What I want to be observed is that in every single one of these passages, the permission to remarry is based on how the first marriage ended. Romans 7, 2, Paul says that after the death of one spouse, the living spouse is permitted to remarry. There, the permission to remarry is based on the fact that their spouse has died, and it's based on how that first marriage ended. Matthew 19, 9, Jesus says that remarriage after divorce is adultery, but then he gives an exception, which is based on how the first marriage ended. So if the first marriage ended for this reason, then remarriage is permissible because the covenant is over. Again, the basis is on the ending of, or is on how the first marriage ended. And finally, 1 Corinthians seven fifteen, where Paul says that in certain cases where an unbeliever separates from a believer, that believer is free to remarry. Again, the permission to remarry is based on the ending of the first marriage. 
But now to the specifics of these passages, starting with Romans 7, 2, where Paul says, for a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Released from the law of marriage. This means that when her husband dies, she is entirely free from that marriage covenant. She is no longer bound to that covenant, and she has been freed from that covenant. In the words of James Dunn, the death of a spouse makes the marriage inapplicable and powerless. That marriage covenant is over. But why does death end the covenant? The reason for this is found in Jesus's words in Matthew 25, 30, where he says that there is no marriage in the resurrection. In the next life, there will not be marriage. So that means that marriage covenants end in this life because they're not going to be continued into the next. So death thereby ends the covenant of marriage and is the first permission for the living spouse to remarry. The second biblical permission to remarry is quite a bit more complicated. It's found in Matthew 19, 9. Here Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife, and I'm going to give the Greek word here in the text, and then I'm going to flesh out what that means here in a little. Whoever divorces his wife except for porneia and marries another commits adultery. There's three things that I need to look at here. First, what is the meaning of porneia? Second, does this exception for porneia apply only to divorce or also to remarriage? And finally, who has the right to remarry in, this, um, in the case of the exception of porneia? As for the meaning of porneia, the general definition of porneia is unlawful sexual intercourse, but some take porneia and give it either a wider or a narrower meaning than that of the general definition. Some widen porneia to mean something along the lines of marital unfaithfulness, referring to not a sexual aspect, but referring to a variety of failures by either one of the spouses. On the other hand, the narrow views limit porneia to mean something along the lines of incestuous marriage or fornication during this betrothal period or other such specific proposals for the meaning of the word. But it is my belief that the meaning of the, that the definition of the word Jesus is using is the general one, unlawful sexual intercourse, summed up as sexual infidelity. The reason I believe this is that both the wide and narrow views are not sound and have proven to not be correct. The wide views take porneia and make it to go or and make it go against its original definition. It takes away the sexual aspect of the meaning of the word and thereby goes against its definition. On the other hand, these narrow views unnecessarily limit porneia to the extent that there is no contextual or textual evidence for limiting it. Craig Keener in his commentary on Matthew comments on Pornea in Matthew 19.9, and he says that most of the specific proposals, and by specific, he's talking about these narrow views, most of the specific proposals for the meaning of Pornea give it a more restricted sense than it normally bears, unless explicitly qualified, which it is not here. There's no te textual or contextual evidence to prove porneia to mean something narrow like incestuous marriage or fornication during the betrothal period. So it is for these reasons that I believe Jesus is talking about sexual infidelity when he talks about, when he uses the word porneia. But when does this exception apply? Does it apply only to divorce or also to remarriage? Many claim, or some claim that that this exception only applies to divorce, that Jesus is applying this exception only to the first half of his sentence when he says, whoever divorces his wife, but he is not also applying this to and marries another, thereby allowing permission to divorce for porneia, but not to remarry. But this is not my belief. Based on my definition of legitimate divorce, legitimate divorce ends the covenant of marriage. So to say that someone who has ended the covenant of marriage cannot remarry is illogical because that means although this covenant is over, they cannot remarry because they're still bound to that covenant. 
the reason one cannot remarry is because they're still bound to a covenant, but that covenant has ended. So there's no basis for saying that only divorce would apply for porneia, while remarriage would not. It's either both or neither. And it is my belief that Jesus is allowing divorce and remarriage for porneia, but for who? Only for the innocent spouse. I believe that the innocent spouse is the only one who has this permission to divorce and remarry in the case of sexual infidelity. The reason for this is that the guilty spouse could then free themselves by their own act of sexual infidelity if they were permitted to remarry, or excuse me, to divorce and remarry for sexual infidelity. They could commit sexual infidelity, anger their spouse by doing so, and then cause their spouse to divorce them. And then they would have freed themselves by their own sin, and they could then enter into a new marriage all because of their own sin. And it is for this reason that I believe Jesus allows divorce and remarriage for sexual infidelity for the innocent spouse. And finally, on my third argument, 1 Corinthians 7.15. Here Paul is talking about marriage between the unequally yoked, between a believer and a non-believer. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.15, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. There's two things I need to look at here. First, what is the meaning of enslaved? And does this, does this imply permission to remarry? And second, what qualifies as separation that one can then remarry after? As for the meaning of enslaved, enslaved comes from the Greek word doulo. But before looking at doulo, I want to first look at another word Paul uses 24 verses later. And based on this word, prove the meaning of doulo. In 1 Corinthians 7.39, Paul says a wife is dedetai to her husband as long as he lives. Dedetai comes from the Greek word deo, meaning to bind. So Paul is saying a wife is bound to her husband. She's bound to that covenant of marriage and she cannot remarry as long as her husband lives. So if she were to be who deo, who being the Greek word for not, not bound, that would mean she is freed of that marriage covenant and permitted to remarry. But looking back at the word Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, with this in mind, Paul uses the word doulo, meaning to make someone a slave or to enslave. This would mean, if it was in reference to a marriage covenant, which it is here, that someone would be bound to that marriage covenant in an even stronger sense of the word than Paul used in verse 39. That person is enslaved to that covenant. They're not free of that covenant. They can't remarry. But that's not what Paul says here. He says, who dulo, not enslaved. That person is not bound to that covenant. They are not enslaved, and they are free to enter into a new marriage, in this case of separation by an unbeliever. But what is separation by an unbeliever? The Greek word that is translated as separates is karizo. Karizo means to physically depart from, or excuse me, to depart from someone or to leave. So based on this, clearly physical departure from someone does qualify as separation. If someone, if the unbeliever physically leaves and divorces their spouse, that believing spouse is permitted to remarry. But what else does this apply to? This also could apply to abuse. I am not gonna be able to get into all the specific cases of abuse as there are infinite possibilities here. But what I do wanna do is take one clear case of abuse that falls into the category of separation. And by taking this clear case, show that there are cases of abuse that may qualify as separation, this being one clear example. The case I wanna take is of an unbelieved, un, unbelieving husband repeatedly physically abusing his wife. In this case, the husband, although the husband and wife are legally married, 
in every sense of the word, they are not married. That husband has shown by his actions that he does not want to be with his wife. He does not love her. And in every way, he is emotionally separated from her. her. He is separated from her in every way except physically. So in this case, he has de facto divorced her. In fact, he has divorced her. Although legally married, by his actions, he has divorced his wife and shown that he does not love her. And by his initiation of a divorce, she can then free herself of this terrible situation by initiating a legal divorce to escape this situation. But one question remains. What about a professed believing husband who's abusing his believing wife? Or specifically physically abusing, repeatedly physically abusing his believing wife. In this case, the church discipline of Matthew 18, 15 through 17 can answer this question. The first step of that wife should be to confront her husband one-on-one. -on -one. Obviously, this is most likely not safe. In this instance, the step can be skipped. And the second step, which should be for her to bring in, should be for her to bring in witnesses to the situation. And the, her, along with those witnesses, should call her husband to, re, to repentance. But if again, her husband refuses to listen to this, she should take him to the church and he should be confronted by church leaders. If even still, he does not heed the call to repentance and does not turn away from his sin, he is to be viewed as an unbeliever and a pagan. Then, being viewed as an unbeliever by 1 Corinthians 7.15 and his de facto divorce, her unbelieving husband's de facto divorce through abuse, she can initiate a legal divorce and free herself of that marriage. And this is the third and final basis I will discuss for remarriage in the Bible. So looking back, was the Church of England right? They were right for looking into the matter. But what they should have done is looked more closely to see why the woman Edward wanted to marry had been divorced in the past and to see whether the, her previous covenants of marriage, covenants that she'd been married twice, to see if those covenants of marriage had ended and if she was free in, to enter into a new marriage. And they should have used scripture as their basis for doing so. Scripture should always be considered when one is trying to determine whether they are biblically permitted to end their marriage by divorce or biblically permitted to enter into a new marriage. Churches and Christians today often fail, often fail to use scripture as they approach divorce and remarriage. And I hope this encourages anyone who knows of a loved one or a church that is failing to consider God's guidance for divorce and remarriage, the, the scripture's guidance for divorce and remarriage to do so. And scripture's guidance is that there are three situations in which one can remarry, all based on how the first marriage ended. And those situations are death, allowing the living spouse to remarry, sexual infidelity, allowing the innocent spouse to remarry, and separation by an unbeliever, allow, whether by abuse or by physical separation, allowing the believer to remarry. Thank you. All right, Luke, we're on to the panel. Luke's panel consists of Mr. Glenn Hoshauer of the Theology Department here at Covenant is his advisor. Uh, second faculty reader is Mr. Jeremy Sturdivant, uh, the head of the theology department, and Pastor Jason Williams of Solid Rock Church. Mr. Hoshauer, let's begin. Now, um, I'm going to pass this off and uh, let uh, our guest go first. I just want to start by saying, Luke, that you clean up pretty well. <laughs> Luke, well done. Thank you. Um, personally edified by uh, your paper and for obvious reasons, but most of all is your handling of the content. Um, and it's encouraging to see a young person care so deeply to invest this much time into a topic that matters this much. So well done. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to begin um, early on. You state that divorce is never God's intention 
even citing Malachi 2.16, God hates divorce. However, the primary thrust of your content is looking for permission. Uh, and so um, you also state that God has permitted divorce in situations that meet certain biblical criteria. So what biblical reasons can you provide to explain why God allows for Christians to divorce if divorce is never his intention? So the, although, so maybe a better way I should have put it is divorce is never God's desire because it is, it goes against his original design for marriage. But being that people sin and um, sin against their spouses in ways that break the covenant because that covenant has been broken through sin. Like for example, take someone who commits sexual infidelity, that sin breaks the covenant. And then that person who is married to them can choose either to mend that covenant and continue in that marriage with them or in that covenant because of their spouse's actions. So I would say divorce God permits divorce because of people's sin, specifically Deuteronomy 24. Um, I think it's, it's either verse one or verse four, where, um, or, or, well, more so Jesus when he says that God permitted divorce because of the hardness of your hearts. It's because of people's sin that this sanction has to be put into place in order to protect people who are wronged by their spouses. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Jeremy, your turn for target practice. Awesome. Looking at, I would also say thank you and very well done. I appreciate your time thank and you. you're pouring your heart into this. Um, okay, Luke, on, on page 13 in your paper and also in your presentation as well, um, you claim that only the innocent party is permitted to remarry uh, when there is a biblical basis for the divorce. So my question is, is more uh, dealing with the other party. Mm -hmm. uh, what then is the status of the guilty party if they do choose to remarry uh, initially and perpetually? Uh, is a person that remarries without biblical justification in a constant state of sin? Why or why not? So um, I've considered this question. I haven't done a ton of research on it, but my belief is um, that I think the the sin is the initial act of remarrying is the sin. Um, the initial sin is the remarriage. It's not a continuous sin of remaining married to that person because I don't believe God would call for someone to get divorced after having entered a marriage they shouldn't have entered in in the first place. So I believe the sin is the initial act. Thank you, Luke. Okay. Um, now, Luke, you gave us three reasons uh, that you think biblically uh, are valid that would permit divorce. Um, uh, presumably, you were suggesting that those those three are the the sum total, or that they are they're not just three examples with fifty others. Yeah. They are the three. Um, I'd like you to address at least the possibility that there's a, a hole in that, and just see if if you can either tell me why it's a hole or how it fits. Um, so you claim that 1 Corinthians 7 deals with the new situation of believers and unbelievers being married, that is to say those who profess faith and those who do not, and that the solution is that believers should not initiate divorce, but that they should uh, acquiesce if it is initiated by the unbelieving spouse. What are we to make of the divorces in Ezra and Nehemiah and the fact that God's people, the believers, were commanded to put, uh, put away or separate, presumably divorce, foreign unbelieving women? So in Ezra and Nehemiah, um, this was a situation where you, this, I'll say this and then I'll go into more detail on this. This was a lesser of the two evils situation. And what I mean by that is um, the Messiah was to come from a sacred line from God's people. And um, that line started as the 12 tribes of Israel, which later became the one and a half tribes of Judah which after being taken captive into Babylon was cut in half as some of those captives after the seven years of Babylon came back to Israel and some remained in Babylon. So, you know, now have a half of a 12th of 
the people of Israel remaining. And the more those people are plagued by the outside influence of others, the more that sacred line could possibly be diminished. So specifically an example, and then I'll, I'll get to the answer, <laughs> is in Nehemiah, um, walls are built around the city in order to keep God's chosen people from being plagued by outsiders to keep them away from those people. Similarly, in Ezra, where this, there is this divorce mandate to divorce their unbelieving spouses, the reason for this is because that sacred line was being further plagued by these foreign women coming in and in marrying these men who were of the chosen line of God. So if you continue to allow this to happen, eventually that line becomes so plagued by these women and their foreign idols that you take away the holy line that the Messiah is to come through. And then where does the Messiah come from? So it's a lesser of the two evils. Either you choose to allow these marriages to continue and not allow the Messiah to come in the world, which would be a problem for all of us, <laughs> or you allow or you mandate divorce for, from these spouses to keep the people pure. And I believe Ezra, directed by God's wisdom, chose the lesser of the two evils there. And then that would make sense in Romans 7, why Paul, in dealing with believers and unbelievers, doesn't cite the example of yes. Ezra and Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. sir. All right. Speaking of the Apostle Paul, he draws a distinction in disputable matters between things that are permissible versus things that are beneficial. And the word that uh, you used uh, over and over again is permissible. And so that's the nature of my question. Is it okay for a believer who is in a situation that meets the criteria for divorce to remain married? And if so, is there any biblical precedent for knowing when to remain married versus when to divorce in situations where the biblical criteria for divorce has clearly been met. So in that case, in the case where they meet the biblical criteria and they can divorce their spouse, they can rightly divorce their spouse. They are not required to, they are permitted to do that. So there's no requirement for them to do that. The Bible permits divorce in these cases, but it doesn't require it. So they are permitted to remain in that marriage as well. As for knowing whether you should remain in that marriage, there's no clear direction from God's word. And I think that's something that should be discussed in community with other believers and highly considered before ending that marriage to see if there is a way to mend that marriage and to, um, to, to, to mend that covenant because at the end of the day, that's ideal. That's what we would hope would happen, but that's not always the case because of hardness of heart of certain people, and you can only do so much. So I would say that's just a decision that needs to be prayerfully handled and also handled um, within the community of believers. Okay, thank you. All right, Luke, this is a, this question is a bit more general than the last one that I asked, uh, and this deals a little more with your research and what you glean from it, and, and I'm not sure um, how much you got here, but as I was reading your paper, this question came to mind. So um, how has uh, your study of church history or historical theology and major theologians uh, through, throughout the church era, how has your study of church history informed your thinking in this area? Um, and has there, as you've done your research, have you come across sort of a thread or a general consensus uh, of what constitutes legitimate divorce and remarriage throughout church history? Is there wide diversity among theologians or did you sense sort of a general sort of common agreement uh, throughout the church age? So your first question is, what did I see throughout church history? And then also, like, how did that change my thoughts on church history or my view of yeah, just as you did your research, did you see a general consensus yeah. regarding kind of what constitutes uh, a legitimate divorce and remarriage, or, or did you did you come across sort of wide scale uh, diversity, and did that affect uh, where you landed 
Yeah, I would say I absolutely did not see a general consensus at all. <laughs> um, this has been debated for centuries and over and over people have gone back and forth trying to determine what God, when God permits divorce and when he permits remarriage. So I would say throughout church history, the general consensus tends to lean one direction but that seems to be ever changing throughout history. There's no one constant. Here's when you can get divorced and remarried. Here's when you can't. It seems to fluctuate. And um, I've even been surprised by certain, certain commentators and authors who have taken certain views that I thought were minority views. But then I find these theologians taking these views that... Um, seem to not be prominent views, but they think are the correct views, like even well-respected theologians like Gordon Fee. Um, so yeah, I would say no, there definitely hasn't been a, we agree on this, it's all over the place. Thank you. Yeah. Luke, I'm gonna follow up on my last question um, about permissible versus beneficial, or maybe scenarios where um, it would be best or beneficial for the, the couple to stay married, even if the criteria is met. And so you referenced uh, community. And so specifically thinking about biblical community, um, I'd like to ask you this question. What is the biblical role of church leadership, pastors, elder board, if any, in guiding believers in making the decision to remain married versus pursuing the divorce in situations where the biblical criteria has clearly been met? Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking as a pastor who yeah. often I'm asked to help make that decision. I'm just curious to know from a biblical perspective um, what your position is. Yeah. Um, first off, I would say since that is obviously a gray area and there's no clear, you should remain in this marriage or you shouldn't, since there's no clear direction on that when the biblical criteria for divorce has been met, I think church leaders should be very cautious in, in telling someone that they absolutely should do this or that they absolutely, like they absolutely should remain there or they absolutely shouldn't. Um, I think that that should be approached carefully and also very considerate of the person's situation and the pain they're feeling in that situation. But I think if they're I don't know what a specific situation would be, would look like where this is the case. If there is a clear situation where someone clearly needs to get out and get, get a divorce or the, or vice versa, I think the church should definitely step in and instruct that person to do so. But I don't know specifically like what that would look like exactly. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, Luke, this will be my last question. And, and this deals really with the connection of, of your research to culture. And so uh, on page six, you discuss the shift in the church from considering to not considering scripture as, as it pertains to divorce or remarriage. And you, you lament the fact that oftentimes scripture is just not considered in this arena anymore. Um, culturally speaking, what do you think has led to this shift uh, from considering scripture to not considering scripture uh, with regard to divorce and remarriage? And what do you think the societal ramifications for such a shift are or, or even will be? Um, I think it all goes back to our understanding of a covenant. And um, I think there's a great misunderstanding about what a covenant is. And if a covenant is a choice or if it's something that is, you're, you're either bound by that covenant or not, you don't get to choose. You don't get to decide that, that covenant doesn't exist for you anymore. I think a misunderstanding about what a covenant is and the sacredness of that union and that breaking that union is a sin and serious sin. I think that that is where this comes from because I think we've come to a point where we look at everything on legal terms, not everything, a lot of things, specifically this issue. And we think, well, legally, I have this option to divorce them. I'm not happy. I don't want to be in this. It's legal. I'm going to go for it. While there's not a consideration of scripture and a looking at the difference between 
that legal doesn't necessarily imply moral and often doesn't. Just because something is legal doesn't make it morally right. And just because you get legally divorced doesn't mean your covenants ended and that you're in the eyes of God, you're still married. Likely if, if you just, it just, I think it all comes from that issue of trying to take things from a legal perspective and not a moral biblical approach under at the heart of that understanding what a covenant is. Thank you. Well, sir, we come to the end and, uh, let me just say that uh, uh, it has been a pleasure, um, sometimes a struggle pleasure, but it has been a pleasure. That's true. And uh, my fi- for my final question, yeah, the question is for which one of us, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> this little truth in advertising, right? Mutual. mutual yeah. Well, I'm so glad that we forget it. We're just going to let that lie there. <laughs> so for my final question, I'm going to ask you a little something different than anything I've asked you before. I figured let's go out with something creatively different. I agree. <laughs> I'm so glad we're on the same page. Luke, what have you learned as a young man regarding marriage from a biblical perspective? Particularly, what surprises or surprising changes have you found in your own mind and heart as you look forward to the possibility of someday being a Christian husband? Yeah. Um, I would say I, before going into this, I already had a high view of marriage and the importance of of a husband loving their wife but as i've done this and i have further looked at the beauty of how christ loved the church specifically reading from saint john chrysostom talking about how christ gave himself up for the church at a time when the church had turned their back we turned our back on christ we were we were literally killing christ and at a time when the church put, was putting him to death, yet he still gave himself up for her. And that is beautiful. And it is, it's something that I, I think every husband should rehearse in their minds over and over as they continue to ponder on that scripture in the way that Christ gave himself up for us and take that and apply it to how we can, how as a husband, And as future husbands, we can love our wives in a way that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that when your wife isn't doing what you want, isn't isn't complying to what you think they should, or when you want to do other things, but your first duty is to your wife, when you want to go hang out with your friends, but your duty is to your wife, I think, I believe that the it just, it's just really shown me what I want to be as a husband and how just really by looking more into that about how Christ loved the church and um, just also just seeing the pain and just the, just the miserable things people are put through because of their spouse's sins and the pain involved in divorces and just wanting to be so far from some of these terrible situations and be in the best marriage I could possibly be in and love my wife the best way I could. Thank you, sir. Here we go. All right. We have very little time left, but I'm going to take at least one question from the audience. (laughs) Mrs. Baker, <laughs> I'm just going to come sit by you. Luke, I'm so proud of you. You did Thank amazing, you. but I know you would. Um, here's my question. In your research, did you find any instances of people that didn't want to be together, but they did not meet the biblical standard for divorce, so they chose to separate but remain celibate and just stay in the marriage but be live apart because you know (laughs) (laughs) because uh, yeah i i did not specifically come across an instance of that um so i can't specifically address that um but as far as separation goes um i haven't i also haven't looked a ton into how does separating for a time play a role in this 
um, separating but not divorcing. But um, yeah, so I haven't specifically looked into that. I'm sorry. One more question. <laughs> so Luke, just I'm really proud of you and the way that you've um, dug into this topic and how it's personal to you and the way that you've handled it. Thank you. It's one thing to theologically be able to engage in the discussion on what the grounds for remarriage are. It's another thing to sit down with two people who are hurt and in pain mm -hmm. and pastorally guide them with these truths. And so if you find yourself in a situation where um, there is a criteria is met and divorce would be permissible, but as you say, divorce is never God's desire, how would you personally pastor those individuals through that circumstance with God's truth? Mm. So although divorce is never God's desire, again, because of sin, it often is not a necessity, but it's permitted because of that sin. But pastoring people through that and specifically people who are considering remaining married despite, despite a sin that broke the covenant and trying to mend that covenant, I think that's a very... That's a huge challenge, and I think it should be handled. I think I would just try my, my very best to handle that in a way that is loving and caring of what they're experiencing, but at the same time in a way that isn't blunt, in a way that is considerate of what they're experiencing and the pain they feel that I probably can't even imagine of being considerate of that while sharing the truth of the of of God's word with them and saying hey here are your options here here's how this applies is it better for you like you have this decision in front of you you can choose to stay married or you can choose not let's like talk through that let's talk about what are the options here and lovingly in a way that also shares God's word with them and the truth from that as well Luke any other questions that people have for you will have to be on their time and yours because officially you are done.